The invocation will be given by the Reverend Donald Abbey, pastor of the Riverside United Methodist Church of Muncie. Shall we pray? O thou great God of all the universe, accept our thanks for many things, for this occasion, for the privileges and opportunities that are ours, for institutions such as this great university, for men and women dedicated to extending their minds and the knowledge of the universe, to teaching skills, to searching out new facts. Teach us, we pray, to know always that life is a great partnership, a partnership between you and all humankind, between teachers and students, between ourselves and our friends and our families, and between all humankind. Teach us the eternal great lessons of life. Now today we pray thy blessings to be upon these trustees, these administrative officers in this faculty, and these graduates. May all of us serve you well. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Graduates, members of the faculty, parents, relatives, and friends, it is a very real pleasure for me to welcome you to this, the 70th commencement of Ball State University. Our music today is being provided by Mr. Kirby Coriath of the music faculty. A singing of the national anthem was led by Miss Barbara Manford, also of our music faculty. I again acknowledge the participation of the Reverend Donald Abbey, who gave the invocation. We are particularly pleased to have with us for this commencement five of the seven members of the Ball State University Board of Trustees. I shall ask each of them to stand as his or her name is called and ask you to withhold your, applaud uh, your applause until all have been introduced. First, the President of the Board of Trustees, Mr. Alexander M. Bracken of Muncie, Mr. Bracken. The Secretary of the Board of Trustees, Mr. Will Parker, also of Muncie, Mr. Parker. The Assistant Secretary of the Board of Trustees, Mrs. Robert O'Malley of Richmond, Mrs. O'Malley. Mr. M. Thomas Harrison of Columbus and Mr. F. Edwin Showweiler of Fort Wayne. Would you please join me in recognizing these trustees? Trustees Tom Wallace of Indianapolis and Lee Morris of Huntington send their regrets at not being able to be here today, along with their sincere congratulations to all of the graduates. Others on the platform I should like to recognize at this time are, and again, would you please withhold applause until all have been introduced. Dr. Richard W. Burkhart, Vice President for Instructional Affairs and Dean of Faculties, Dr. Burkhart. Dr. Robert P. Bell, Vice President for Business Affairs and Treasurer, Dr. Bell. Dr. Merrill C. Byrell, Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students, Dr. Byrell. Dr. Oliver C. Bum, Vice President for Public Affairs and University Development, Dr. Bum. Dr. Victor B. Lawhead, Dean of Undergraduate Programs, Dr. Lawhead. Dr. Robert H. Kenker, Dean of the Graduate School, Dr. Kenker. Dr. Paula Carter, President of the Ball State University Alumni Association and also Executive Officer of the Indiana State Vocational Advisory Council, Dr. Carter, and of course, Ms. Manford and Reverend Abbey, whom you have met earlier. Now, would you please join me in expressing appreciation to these people? <laughs> While
Well, it is always a privilege and an honor to introduce a commencement speaker. It is particularly so today, and it gives me genuine pleasure to introduce him. Schools, colleges, and universities seek to promote achievement. Our speaker today has achieved distinction in his chosen field, and through his achievements, the lives of millions have been enhanced. Jesse Stewart was born on a farm in W. Hollow, Greenup County, Kentucky. He began both his own education and his teaching in a one-room school. A writer, he began his craft while a student in Greenup High School. A graduate of Lincoln Memorial University in Tennessee, Mr. Stewart also studied at Vanderbilt University and George Peabody College for Teachers. In addition to his teaching in a one-room school, Mr. Stewart has taught at the high school level. He served as a high school principal and a county superintendent. His college-level teaching included American University in Cairo, Egypt. His philosophy of life and his knowledge of the art of writing have been shared with numerous audiences in colleges, universities, and communities around the world. The author of some 40 books he also was recognized as one of the outstanding poets of America. His short stories are used as models by teachers in the field. One of his novels is called A Masterpiece of Satire and has sold more than two million copies. Stories, poems, and excerpts from longer works, which have come from his pen, have been reprinted in hundreds of textbooks in this country and dozens of other countries on every continent of the world. He is recognized by educators as one of the most constructive modern authors. As popular on the lecture platform and in seminar rooms as for his written works, Mr. Stewart has spoken to hundreds of groups of educators and students. Only this week he was a teacher on our own campus in our Midwest Writers Workshop. His many contributions to the field of writing and to the quality of life have brought him several recognitions, including serving as a specialist with the United States Information Service of the United States State Department, American representative to an Asian Writers Conference, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and numerous prizes for writing, including the selection of one of his works as a Book of the Month and another as Best Book of the Year by the National Education Association a charming and delightful and warm human being, an achiever, and a respecter of the essential qualities of life, I am honored to present him to you now, Mr. Jesse Stewart, who will speak on the topic, The Dream. Mr. Jesse Stewart. <clears throat> President and Mrs. Pruess, uh, faculty, uh, members, school administrators, uh, the trustees and their wives, uh, graduates, your friends, parents, relatives, everybody. It is fine to come here because I have always had uh, an emotional something with Indiana. Uh, the lady who introduced me at the Midwestern Writers Conference said she had always had an emotional thing with me. She had never met me. She had had it through my books. Now, I've had it in this state. I know your graduates down there are not all from Indiana. I know your parents are not all from Indiana, and your faculty members are not. But just somehow, it's Indiana. And let me tell you how it goes back quickly. In 1916, in a one-room school, Earl L. Riley was teaching 56 classes in six hours. I was a little boy in that school. We had three pictures on the wall. One was George Washington, one was Abraham Lincoln, and one was James Whitcomb Riley. And he gave me a book of Riley's Farm Rhymes. Now, I've mentioned that since, and people have laughed. 
Well, I didn't laugh. It meant something to me. I was a little boy out there on the a Kentucky hillside farm, and I leveled with it. It was just simply great. Then, a few years later in high school, I was studying Indiana writers. I, got, I could, never could escape Indiana writers. There's the elementary, high school, and at the university level. I had Booth Tarking at the university level, and I had Theodore Dreiser. And incidentally, in a book just published for you people in the English division here, uh, it's American fiction. There's only 44 novelists and fiction writers accepted. Those two people out of the first 50 years is in that 50, or 44. So they did make high, and I'd pick the right people. I wrote a perm term paper on Theodore Dreiser, and at that time didn't like him too well, but I did it. Now, I also, there's something else. What I call my first big talk happened in Indianapolis in 1935. Now, I won't tell you how much I was paid for that talk, but I spoke there, and I, it was great. I jumped up and down. I've made Indiana. I got to Indiana. Then another thing happened in 1940. I was one of the late ones on a group to go to the Indiana University to teach creative writing. How much did I know about teaching? I don't know. I had several books out at that time. And I got out there, and I was the small boy on the totem pole, but something happened to one of the big boys on the totem pole, and I was pushed up. That's my first time ever teaching creative writing. It was at IU in 1940, and my wife and I'll never forget it. We went back to find the place. We danced with the students. We were just married. What a great time we had at IU. Uh, it was just wonderful. Now, um, I want to bring up something else to you here. I was reminded by a good friend of mine, Jerry Masters, to get back and read the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Now, not being a student that goes back into that, I thought I obeyed them and all and tried to, but I didn't know that they were as precious as what they were, and it set me off on a chain reaction to go back, and I advise you to do this if you haven't re read them in a long time. Because a handful of people, as compared to now in America, set up a country. It was the dream country of the world. Your ancestors came here because of it, every one of you out there. Mine came here. They came to get rid of the king and queen. They came from here. They came from Scotland. And uh, they came to this country. They came, uh, and we had the government. Go back and read it. There was never a finer government ever set up. I, I'm going to modify this. I haven't read what the British have, but it's a good government, what the British have lived by. It's an awfully good government. But they came, we set up. Why could, can you believe that we had a country, not at that time exactly, we had a country that started on the East Coast, on the Atlantic, went up to Canada, and if some Kentuckians hadn't missed in two battles up there fighting Indians, all Canada would have been also the United States, uh, we barely missed it. And we had, look how this country was formed, piece by piece clear out to the West Coast. Now, I had students in high school, I taught high school history too, that used to challenge me on how we got part of America. And when they challenged me, I thought they might be right, but I turned and walked away. I was glad we had it from coast to coast. I was right glad we have it because we've got every type of a country under the sun. And these people all coming to this dream. Look, the Germans and the Holland Dutch and the Danes, what smart people they were. They took the best farming land. You go out here in Indiana and look at these mailboxes. And if you don't believe this is good farming land, you come down and drive through East Kentucky and see that. Now, Iowa, Illinois, what a breadbasket for the nation it was and now for the world is your. And when I like to come to Indiana is August so I can get out in these cornfields and drive and see them, endless. What a beauty. 
What an unmistaken beauty. Now, the size of this country is tremendous, as one of my students asked me once in Cairo University. She said, Mr. Stewart, why don't more of your students uh, learn more languages? And I looked at her right fast, and I had to get an answer. Those students are very bright. And I said, one of our people can start in Maine in an automobile and drive across the United States of America to San Francisco and never speak but one language, a distance of over 300 mi 3,000 miles. That student can, couldn't get over it. There is your answer to many, so many people knowing so many languages. They're in little countries, and that's, that is why. Now we had here in this country, and you saw it on uh, the covered wagon and our old movies and uh, wagon train, TV, all in, in endless books. How the Americans migrated from the east across. They went on foot, they went in covered wagons, they came down the high river and spread up through here. They came up in the southeast through two important passes. Uh, Cumberland Gap was one of them, the big pass, getting up into this territory. But they moved on foot, on horseback, by uh, oxen, and not by automobiles in those days, and they walked, and they got on to California. They crossed this country, one of the greatest westward movements that has ever been in any country. It is romantic, it is great, it spread the people. It really, it was, it was really something. And America now could be, could, was, it was my dream. I found out America's my dream, but tra travel, I'll mention that to you. I had never seen America until I got out of it. I had to get out to see America. Now, uh, but we, America, I call this talk the dream. And uh, we say now a lot of people, and that's what these young people, here's the potential right down here in front of me. They're the young going out there and replacing us. They're going to be out there, the citizens of tomorrow. And uh, they've got something in front of them. We say that there's no more new frontiers. Well, I've discovered there are some new frontiers. And I'm going into a few of them briefly when I speak up here. The first one I'm going to take up with you is medicine. It's a new frontier. My sister couldn't get in a medical school, and neither could my niece. My niece went on and did the best next thing, she married a doctor. Uh, my, both of them brilliant science students, and my sister never could get in because they just didn't, they had a number they let in the, the uh, medical schools. Now, people today, I just turned in the paper. We were driving back from Brown County yesterday, and I saw in there shortage of doctors. Still, shortage of doctors. Why? Have you read U.S. News and World Report, one great chapter in there? There are hospitals in New York where the doctors, not a doctor can speak English, and not a nurse can speak English. Every three doctors in this country practice in medicine, one of them was born and educated outside the United States. Why couldn't we educate and expand and send our doctors out, I tell you, our doctors, the doctors we've taken from some of these other countries are badly needed in those countries. Uh, my wife and I ha are widely traveled. I've traveled in 90 countries and she's traveled in 70. I've worked in nine, over nine, uh, taught over there. I could tell you a lot, time doesn't permit it up here, but uh, the medicine end of it, you ought to see. They need doctors. Why couldn't we be the forward? Our medicine, our doctors and our medicine don't. Now, I'm not bringing up this, some of this stuff about suing doctors and all. That's terrible. Uh, our medicine is the greatest in the world, I think. If it hadn't been for a specialist in uh, the heart, I wouldn't be up here talking to you. Because I've had it. I know what hospitals are, and I know what medicine is, and that's what may, makes me think on these terms. I, don't, I think, now, in medicine, we need more doctors. We, we really need them. I will <clears throat> drop off of that because they're needed all over the world, and we could send out. If our doctors are as good as our school teachers, 
that we send out, well, they're the best. Literature, I'm going to come to that. I've been 45 years in this. Can you believe it? In college days. I was in, it was 1930 when my first little book was published, which I tried to kill, tried to destroy all the copies. Nine have existed. If you buy one, if you can find it, you'll either pay from $1,000 to $2,500 for it. You can't kill a book. I couldn't kill mine. I didn't like it. I decided I didn't like it. And I wanted, I had, I had actually paid to have that little book published. And after that, the big companies took me. A teacher told me I belonged to big companies. We're going to get into this. Now, in literature, what has happened to books? What has happened, uh, let me just give you an idea. I'll tell you what's happened. When I first went to New York in 1935, after Man the Bull Tongue Plow was published, I caught the George Washington for my first train ride east, had one of the best meals I ever ate on that, uh, in the dining room, and had a sleeper, rode into Washington, D.C., got another car, a train, the New York Central, on into New York, arrived at 1 o'clock. In other words, I was going from Ashland, Kentucky at 9 to 1 o'clock the next day to get into, or was it 3, three o'clock the next day I got in New York. But I got there. My publishing house wasn't any bigger than this column of people right here, the publishing house. I knew everybody in the publishing house, those who were dating. My editor was about to get married. He'd brought his fiance in, was publishing her book. And uh, <laughs> if I wanted anything, he told me where to get it, where to eat. Here's a family thing. They were wonderful. Never enjoyed anything anymore in my life. My hat is two sizes too small. Uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Well, let me tell you, those were good days. And then later I took my bride in one or two years and she went with me. She found out what the publishing was. If she wanted something, they took her to the store. They had that kind of time. They helped us. Now when I go to New York to my publishing house, I drive a car to Huntington, West Virginia, or we do, catch a plane straight through, two hours. Land in LaGuardia, 30 minutes more, we're in the hotel. 30 more minutes, we are at Big McGraw Hill, which is a skyscraper. You won't know it exactly unless you look carefully because it's got the Irvin Trust on the bottom of financial concern. Now, let me just uh, stop on that. That is laughable regarding, regarding my publishers. They had a man, Clifford Irvin, who wrote the biography of Mr. Hughes, the uh, multi-billionaire, and he conned the book, and he sold it to McGraw-Hill for $500,000. Well, that created a national scandal, and yet they've got this trust company on the bottom, the Irvin Trust Company. <laughs> everybody sees that, and everybody laughs. So we, I go there, and maybe... I'll have an appointment in advance. In that big publishing house, I will eat with my editor on the 50th floor, on the 50th floor. I will not see many people, very few. 45 magazines are published in that house. How big is it? Well, it's got a division in, uh, uh, it's got three divisions in this country I know of. It's got one in California, one in Missouri, maybe Cleveland, Ohio, I'm not sure. New England, I know, and of course it's, uh, the central offices are in New York, then it's in London, then it's in Germany, it is in, uh, I believe, Greece, I know it's big in Japan, and big in Australia. Now, is it a conglomerate? I don't know whether it's a conglomerate or not. If there's a little house out there, like, uh, well, I won't mention the house, somebody mentioned to them one time, and they just walked down and bought it up. I don't know, they're, they, uh, they make uh, one half billion a year. 
And who, who were the rest of the authors when we were uh, competing with Clifford Irwin, who had, they called it the book, the book. We were just little authors out there, but we little authors are still around. And Mr. Irwin had a sentence. He, he got a sentence out of it. Now, I am not run down authors. I'm just telling you facts. What can happen about this publishing? But this is not it. What has happened when you cannot get a collection of short stories published in America? What has happened when you can't get a novel published? I don't know how many companies today will not take novels and how many will not take poetry. They're our oldest art forms. You know why? We have over-advertised the no-books, the no-books. And if you want to know what a no-book is, you people who go to old bookstores, go down and check over in some of these old bookstores. Some of these books published 10 years ago, Ballyhooed to the Skies, and see if you can't pick them up for 50 or 75 cents. Then go and try to buy one of Stewart's and see what you pay for it. Mine are no books, are not no books. And I'm happy to say that, but I'm saying literature needs revamping. It is one of the things. We need quality in our writing in America, not particularly no books. What does the subject matter come down to? You can't tell me the novel's not good. You can't tell me poetry's not great. You can't tell me a short story's not wonderful. Because I know they are, and they're great art forms. And if we leave them for a while, we will come back to it. Um, now, another one of our, uh, our, our, our things that uh, uh, our travels in Africa is business and industry. My wife and I have done a lot of traveling and uh, business and industry, what we have come to in this. In Africa, one of the things I found, you can't believe it, this produced in America, but before this, let me tell you, I was in Europe in 19 and 37 and 38 and lived over there on the Guggenheim Fellowship, traveled in 28 countries. There's American automobiles in most every country. There's American products in those years. Now, in 19 and uh, 30, uh, uh, 66, we were pretty well over Africa, again in 69. And uh, the only thing that I found that was uh, made in America everywhere for sale was the Coca-Cola. That is all we found. Uh, the other cars had taken over. You never found an American-made car unless it was at the embassy in one of those countries. We have simply just lost out. Uh, but there's one thing, and I have to go a little faster on this. Uh, one of the things that they, they didn't uh, is not out. In America that we produce in business and industry, and you know what it is, you're right in the heart of it, farm country. Look at the exports of our wheat and our corn. Our farmers, no wonder their lifespan is six years shorter than the other people, but they produce. We produce, our farms produce for the world, and it kind of keeps us balanced and even going. But what else are we exporting? You go over there and show me accepted American embassies where there's an American car. But I'll show you many foreign-made cars here. There's plenty of them, but over there, it's a different story. Uh, And in our politics and government, I want to bring this in. Uh, we have it. We really have. 
When my, uh, when my 32, in 1973, when a book of mine, 32 Votes for Breakfast, was published, in this book were political stories from both parties. Maybe some of you read that. I told of how the people of my party voted one man in 32 precincts. They couldn't believe it. The other side let down. Just let us vote him. That man was on my side, that we voted 32 times. But he is almost dead when we got through with him. He hadn't had anything to eat. He was wanting something to eat. But all of this has gone on. Maybe we will get away from it. I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, politics and government is something in this country. We need a, uh, but it is good. It is still good. We still have two parties. And when we get down to the one party system, as I'm afraid we're going, uh, it's going to be bad. You've never lived in a country with one party like we have. You try it. When we lived there, Egypt had one party. It's a good country to us, fine, but it's a one party system. And you do what one party says. Now, in this country, there's always the other side. And we live that way, and it's great, and please, let's keep it. Let's keep a good, strong two-party system in this country. Uh, uh, education, and this is mine. I have to bring this up in education. I've practiced it, I've worshipped it, I've spoken for it, I've written articles, stories, and books on education, and here... I am in Ball State University, which had the reputation before it became a university and since as being one of the greatest educational institutions in America. You know where I found this out? Not here. I found it out at Peabody College, and I found out the president down there was from here. He's from uh, the, here. And they say when Peabody tells you, you can look out. Right here is one of the greatest in the United States in education. Now, uh, uh, so I was, uh, some of the thoughts, some of my thoughts and suggestions recorded in the thread that runs so true have been used as textbooks in 28 Arab and French-speaking countries. They want our kind of education. And uh, I hope it gets to them. And I hope more teachers can get over to them there. I hope they can get our vocational education. Uh, our vocational education. We lead uh, the world, I think, in vocational education. And we lead the world in school teachers. And they've come from here. This is a great institution. I want to tell you this while I'm standing up here speaking to you, because I might not be back here again. Uh, <clears throat> Now we've had something to happen, I listen to this, which bothered me no end, was a teacher strike one month before school was out. It bothered me no end. They didn't associate very well with their principals. I believe teachers, I'm an old teacher, I've been principal, I'd rather be a teacher, but I think you've got to associate together and make the whole. I don't think you can do it without the association. Well, here they divided. And they have had problems, believe you me. They've had lawsuits. They've had everything. Maybe you know where it is. I'm not going to tell you. But they've had it, and they've had it in a tough way. And that is no way to run a school system. That is no way to do it. They've had these strikes and went right toward the end of the year. And they are my, if I'd have received that pay when I was teaching school, I'd have been receiving awfully good pay. I don't think people teach school for the big money in it. I think we teach because we love it and we can live at it. I would like to see people live. It is one of those great professions. It is one of the greatest professions in the world because it teaches all other professions. Now they're, they're into it over there, and uh, I have followed that. I have followed other ones, the strikes over the country, teacher strikes. I know a lot of them don't get enough money. I know that is true. Uh, you know, 
in a school, I'd like to say this too before I get off the school. I always had discipline in mind, and I always explained to the students I'd take a world almanac or a calendar, and I'd show the discipline of the universe. The, world, the universe has discipline, and a school should have discipline. And students understand. So I, I, I never had any problems. If we didn't have a working noise, I'd throw a book to make the noise, to, to excite a noise in the classroom. I think we have to have it. My time is running out up here. Uh, I could go on and on, but I'm not going on and on. Now, I cannot cover all that needs to be said and done in this brief mes message, not at all, because we've got things before us in this country. We really have. We've got the new frontiers, each one of them should be investigated. You people should work for it and to clean these places and to continue with a two-party system in this country. Boy, it's built on it. And, and go right on because we have, in my estimation, I've been in 90 countries, and we, I've been in some awfully fine countries, uh, but uh, one of my favorite countries is Greece, and I'm not Greek, and I'm afraid to go back over the troubles over there. I know the Greeks. Some of the finest students I've ever taught have been Greeks over there. And, uh, but I, I hope that the world uh, uh, comes up. Maybe you can help it. And uh, this is the great country right here. And so much of the world depends on what you do out there. You graduate here. So much of it depends on what you're going to do. You're in the limelight tomorrow. We are going to fade out, but I hope teachers can continue, and we can continue at an evening, even keel. We have the greatest teachers in the world. There's no question about it. A teacher that is a lemon here in this country is a sweet apple in Egypt. I made that statement before. Uh, it's true. We, are, we had one fellow that couldn't teach anywhere that we got him on our hands. He'd failed everywhere over here. We got him in Egypt. Well, he turned out to be a right decent teacher over there. Uh, he got to be something. He was very proud of it. He, I guess he's still over in Egypt. Uh, one of the places where he's recognized. Because students over there will really work the teacher. The teacher doesn't work the student. The student works the teacher. It's been nice to speak to you this morning, to all of you here. I've been here many times before. Never knew I'd be here and deliver a commencement. I never knew that. But I've spoken to teachers here after the war when they had so many boys up here, and boys weren't in the other schools. Uh, they were uh, right here at Ball State College, it was then, now university. And uh, you've been a great, this is a great institution. You have been great, you're still great. And it's a privilege and an honor to come up here and to give this a uh, uh, brief uh, speech to you this morning. I thank you very much. Mr. Stewart, the warmth of that applause can say better than I how much all of us enjoyed this. Thank you for sharing of yourself so very genuinely with us this morning. I think your writings will be even more real to us as a result of this opportunity to come to know you better. And we would say, sir, please do keep on speaking and keep on writing, and also please do come back to Ball State University. <laughs> 